right out of, ah, thank you. Based Maybe you want right to start of, again. <laughs> no, it's all good. No one needs to know all that stuff about me. <laughs> <laughs> She's based, Tanya is based out of Atlanta, Georgia. She's a professional certified coach. Woohoo. Credentialed by the International Coaching Federation, of which she is a director of the Professional Coaches Global Board and past president of the ICF Georgia chapter. Tanya is a faculty member of the Institute for Professional Excellence in Coaching, IPEC, and her writing has been featured in several publications, including Forbes and HuffPost. She is a contributing member of the Forbes Coaches Council and an executive leadership coach for the TED Fellows Coaching and Mentoring Initiative. Tanya has over 25 years of experience in corporate management, digital and traditional media, technology, finance, coaching, and leadership development. She works with numerous of organizations across a variety of industries, including Fortune 500 companies. With a master's degree in organizational leadership from Gonzaga University and as a summa cum laude graduate of the University of Tennessee in Business Administration with accounting, Tanya is pursuing a doctorate in leadership psychology from William James College. Welcome, Tanya. <laughs> Thank you. Wow, I'm exhausted just listening to all that stuff. I hope I do all that. Uh, <laughs> hello, everyone. Welcome, welcome. Good day, wherever you are. I'm so excited to be here with you and appreciate you all taking the time. I Yes, I'm a member of the ICF Professional Coaches Global Board. Let me get all those words in there. Uh, but also, I am, uh, I'm still technically past, immediate past president of the ICF Georgia chapter and know the kind of work and commitment it takes as members and as chapter leaders to keep our chapters moving, especially in the last couple of years where we had to be extra creative and, and supportive of, of one another. So I thank you all for taking time out of your day to come hang out and listen to me, but more importantly, to learn about the future of coaching. Uh, I like things to be pretty interactive, so I may ask you some questions. Who knows what's going to happen? I'll be interested to see too. So <laughs> let me share my screen here. Um, but again, feel free to ask questions, jump in, and um, let, let's just kind of have a little session here to connect and learn and, and grow together. Um, so starting out, obviously, I'm here to talk about the future of coaching. And again, these are, are us taking a moment to look at where we see things heading, but I also want to hear from you as well. I want to hear what you're noticing, what you're experiencing, um, because obviously we have a view from global and from the work and the surveys and, and the engagement that we have, but also what's most important is some of the things that you're seeing out there as well. So we want to have this be a very interactive, hopefully, discussion. So let's talk about the definition of coaching. Well, uh, Tanya, I think we all know that because we're coaches, uh, but I um, want to start to really think about uh, understanding how that may be evolving, right? So way back in the day, uh, old school, coaching was, um, we had to really be clear about defining it because coaching was kind of seen as remedial. That wasn't how that word works, uh, <laughs> remedial in that, that oh, we, that's what you do when someone's got, you know, a problem or who is a problem. Um, and it was very important for us to define that, okay, coaching isn't remedial, but also we had to define coaching in the context of what it wasn't. So it's not consulting, it's not mentoring, it's not therapy, and it, it's, and it isn't training, right? Because those were the only things people really knew. So they were trying to fit us in someone else's box. Now coaching is established enough that we can say what it is. And we all know our definition of coaching is partnering oh. with, hello, we got to mute. If we do a little muting there in case someone's got life happening behind us, which is one of the benefits of 2020 and 2021 that we get to see pets and animals. And if anyone has a pet, I'd be happy to see them. Please feel free to bring them out. Um, but our definition of coaching, as you know, as of now, is partnering with clients in a thought-provoking uh, creative process that inspires them to maximize their personal and professional potential. And when we think about what's the future of that, that definition of coaching could actually incorporate other elements of support um, that, you know, again, we already noticed that there's some connection to things like cognitive behavioral 
behavioral therapy. Um, I mentioned that I'm a, a doctoral candidate right now, and one of the things that comes up a lot is understanding, you know, how far in the past do we go, right? How deep do we go? At what point are we crossing that line? We'll talk about that a little bit more, but just recognizing that as coaching, as the definition of coaching has already evolved, it will continue. And it's just really important for us to be aware of what that evolution looks like so that we know where our boundaries are uh, and where it makes sense for us to be and where it isn't the best use of our skills or helpful or beneficial to the client to start to wander in those areas. So it is something that's evolving and we just wanna be aware of that. Let's talk about one question that comes up so much, um, and it's always as, a, as a, a coach trainer, that's the first thing, the first letdown we have on day one is when we tell our students, uh, you don't give advice as a coach. And they're like, what? That's why I'm here, because I'm really good at telling people what to do. That's what I thought I was coming to coach training to do, is to give advice. Um, but we know as coaches that that isn't something we do. Uh, we aren't mentors, we aren't counselors in that way. Um, so it was always kind of that very firm, no, coaches don't give advice. When we see our current trends, though, and I would love to hear from any of you if anyone wants to share, we, we have evolved into asking permission to share knowledge with the client, right? Presenting things as information and, and options for them to consider when the client asks for it or when we feel it's in service to them. Um, would love to hear any thoughts or comments you all had around what your thoughts on giving advice or what your experience has been. Who'd like to share? Don't everybody get up at once. I, have, I only give advice if I feel I'm qualified to do so. Mm -hmm. And tell me what does qualified mean for you? Well, if the, if the advice is outside of the coaching realm um, or something that I know to be uh, part of what they're working on, then I just prefer not to do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and so knowing our, our boundaries and our limits, right? Not just, hey, I heard this, this is what I think you should say. So if it's not something you have some level of personal expertise on, that's not something that, that you wanna venture into, even in just offering them uh, options to think about. Anyone else have a thought or a comment around how they deal with advice questions, like <laughs> clients, what do you think I should do? I'm like, oh, that's not what I'm gonna answer. Uh, if I may, I believe that uh, when I coach people in my uh, former experience, I'm, I was working for tech industry software, major one, US and uh, German, you should know. When I am in the business, as I said, my colleague, uh, when I know something, I, I feel that sometimes you need to share and ask permission because they are frustrated always to have questions. So sometimes it's good to balance to because if not, it's, uh, it's just a questioning. So I think that there is a small balance to keep to because if not, if not, they don't feel that there is any advice. But as, as you mentioned, if I don't feel comfortable in the area, I won't give any uh, things. Yeah, so not just, hey, I heard it. Let me see, here's what I think off the top of my head if you don't really yeah. have any expertise in it. Joan, yeah. I think I saw you would unmute it and then we'll do Karen. Yeah, you know, I have a, I'm thinking of a client. She does sometimes ask me what I think. Mm -hmm. um, and I always, you know, the, the coach approach is, their wisdom. So I may, I will share something if I have something to share and I'll, then I'll turn it back to them. How does that land with you? Cause it's really just fodder for their own process in my view. Exactly. Exactly. It's, it's that, it's that um, always giving it back to them to see how it connects because unlike mentors, we're not here to say, you know, here's how I did it and follow me. It's just, here's a way, what other ways come up for you. And this may give you, it's, it's you know, an, another idea or thought process to consider. Awesome, Joan. Karen. Hi, nice Hi. to see you, Tanya, and, uh, and feel your energy over the, over the Zoom waves. <laughs> good, um, good. I hope that's good. I don't know. <laughs> uh, it's all good. It's all good. I've been coaching for 27 years. So I was at the bleeding edge of this coaching movement, uh, the new <laughs> movement. And um, back then it was really all about just asking questions and I used to coach a lot of entrepreneurs and I also had, you know, real world experience in being able to help them. And it would frustrate the heck out of them to know that I would know something that could really accelerate their process or their progress. And I, I just kept noticing how frustrated they were. And I would still, because my, the model, you know, I couldn't go outside of the lines because that would not be good coaching was just to keep asking questions. It, and sometimes 
it really was so frustrating that we would I would lose clients. They just knew. So I started exploring it and I discovered that actually when I later when I got into my coaching certification, that it is okay. And it's along the lines that you're talking about. It's either asking permission or it's offering, because like the, what Joan said, they'll ask like, well, what do you think? And I'll say, I'm happy to share what I think or what I think might be possible for you. I'd like to hear first what you have to say. So I will take that kind of a, a tactic or you know an approach to it. And um, I just think it's, it's um, we don't want to lose people when it's really something where they just have no frame of reference. I think we have a responsibility to move them forward if we can. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that, Karen. And that's that perfect transition around this into the future is about recognizing that as we look at the future around quote unquote advice giving, should a coach offer advice as part of the coaching partnership if we believe it will help the client move forward, right? That is one of our core competencies is helping the client move forward. And um, as I said earlier, recognizing where's the line, right? Where have I gone too far? And now I am consulting or now I am mentoring. Um, but to your point, Karen, there's that, that frustration that comes, especially when you do have expertise um, to recognize that there is, it is important to help our clients move forward, but balancing that against making sure they understand it is just one of many other options available to them. Just because it happened that way for me doesn't mean it's going to work for you, but what resonates for you from what I shared, right? What it, what from my experience seems to have some connection for you. So we never want to disempower our clients by telling them the answer or giving them the answer because, hey, that may not be the answer for them. And then they've had, had no responsibility and they're looking at you because you gave them quote unquote bad advice. Um, but knowing that if it's in service of moving them forward and we do have expertise, then we want to make sure that we are supporting our client in ways that are useful for them without giving them the answers. So wonderful. Thank you for sharing all of you. Um, and, and keeping in mind, and I'm on this big kick these days around this, uh, recognizing there is an inherent power differential. As much as we talk about it being a partnership, and it is, as coaches, I consider all of my coaching relationships partnerships. But since this person is paying us money to come and support them in their goals, there is implicitly a belief potentially from them that we have magical levels of knowledge and expertise and that we do, even if it's not something we are purposely trying to create, there is an inherent power differential. So to be careful and cautious about how we share information experiences expertise, truly presenting it as just one of many options and not again, that I am the authority, I am the expert giving you an answer. So hopefully that connects for everyone, but thank you all for sharing. Yeah, Karen. I just, I, that was a really great last bit there. It's, it's, um, we're, gosh, and I, it's not giving them uh, advice, but you, you are trying to, um, it is about building the bridge that, oh, I just lost my train of thought because that was that last little bit back in the recording. Um, it'll come back. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. No, let it, but yeah. And again, I, you know, I, and that's something that I, I, I have been trying to focus in more. Also, I do a lot of work on diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, understanding power differentials is so important because people will see us as well. You're, you're my coach. So you must know these things. And it's important that we are just presenting it as um, options, just like anything else. If we were, if we were brainstorming together, it just so happens that maybe this is something I, I have more knowledge in than others. I, I thought of it. It goes back to the definition. Thank you. <laughs> so there's two definitions here. It's like, when we're talking about advice, are we saying that it's like the, it's, it's the gospel, lack of a better way to say it. It's the truth. Yeah. Or is it just, it's one of many options for you to consider. So there's something about the definition of advice that might be paid, we might have to take a look at. And the other part of it is the definition of coaching. And is that definition an ICF definition or is that a very globally uh, accepted definition? Yeah, and obviously we have our ICF definition, but to your point as well, because coaching is still unregulated, so it is a bit of the wild, wild west, and there are people out there with all sorts of stuff happening. Um, so the more that we can start to come to a common language on that, uh, which we hope will obviously come out of the ICF and the work that we all do globally uh, to, to try to educate on what coaching is that, you know, but to get that clarity so that people understand it. Um, and, and I share that as, as well when we talk about expertise that we may have. Uh, I've met coaches who are MDs, 
right? <laughs> and so there is that's another level of assumption that you have more knowledge, quote unquote, more power in this relationship. So they people put more weight behind our words. So it's just really important to be aware of that when we talk about sharing experiences, sharing options, um, that we are presenting them just as that. Really good. Thanks, everyone. See, look at this. We're all talking and chatting here. It's just like I got together with a group of friends. Uh, and I'm very Southern. So uh, everybody, people are like, do you know them? I'm like, no. <laughs> but don't I? Don't we all know each other? Um, so now we're, as, and this is actually a good segue as well, because that line, knowing where that line is, it's important for us to think about, okay, how does this connect when we talk about uh, should we ever, how do we refer clients? I don't think it's really a question of should we ever refer a client to therapy? Uh, if it's in their best interest, of course, yes, we should. I don't think that's a, a surprise or, or a, a conundrum for, for anyone. The question maybe really is when is it right to refer someone to therapy? And that's really what I think we want to start to talk about and focus on a little bit more as we, in our discussion today. Uh, should coaches work with clients who need or are already involved or have access to other mental health services. Um, I can tell you personally, yes, I definitely, and I'm sure many of you as well, have clients who may also be in therapy who are coming to me for coaching. Um, the ICF white paper, uh, referring a client to therapy, and I'll have a page at the end with all these links, and I'll share these links with you to these um, different pieces of research, and I'm sure you, many of you already have them. Um, but in our referring a client to therapy white paper, we talk about uh, really providing the set of recommendations to help someone who may be experiencing mental health issues. It's important to note though, every individual as we know is unique and requires support tailored to their needs. And that's again, one of my areas, diversity, equity, inclusion, but different cultures, um, healthcare systems, access that they have. So the guidelines in the white paper are based on expert opinions of mental health professionals. And we pulled in uh, people and coaches as well from Australia, South Africa, Canada, Netherlands, the United States, um, who know uh, about how to know when someone should maybe developing uh, issues that require more serious mental health uh, support and how to refer that person to a mental health professional. So again, I don't think it, it's really a question as to whether or not we should <laughs> uh, ever refer a client to therapy. It's just under, it's, it's when should we refer a client to therapy? And that's what we really wanna focus on and think about as we talk about this today is understanding um, when should we do it? So big category, short summary, uh, and when it's outside our competency and experience level, if it's if the client's having challenges that are interfering with their daily functioning, right? So we know when we talk about clinical depression, I mean, not being able to get out of bed, they're not able to do things that they normally would in their lives, that would probably be an indicator for us that we might want to consider referring uh, someone to therapy. Um, if they're having an issue that's a barrier to making progress. So if someone is just stuck, and it may seem like it's something relatively uh, small, quote unquote small, to us as coaches. But if a client is stuck on that issue and what some, what's keeping them stuck is something from the, the past, that could indicate a deeper trauma that's going to require more therapeutic support than we as coaches would offer. Uh, also issues that are psychological in nature, um, physiological, even potentially in nature, and that deals with some of those deep-seated emotions. So as a coach, we, as you all know, we explore the past. We explore people's family and their emotions as part of what we do as coaches. Um, but we only tap into that as much as we need to so that the client can take that awareness and move forward with it. We're not trying to diagnose or treat that past trauma. Um, and if they need that, because some for some people, it isn't, um, it isn't, deep enough that they're not able to recognize it for what it is and move forward. But for some, it is. It's something that needs to be addressed and healed and, and worked on from a more clinical level. And if that's the case, we want to make sure that we draw that line. So if the client needs help that goes outside of our qualifications and our competencies and our ethics as coaches, we want to refer them to that external help and really co-creating next steps with the client as to what happens with the coaching from there. So maybe the coaching continues. Uh, maybe it's postponed, we put it on pause, or maybe it's terminated altogether until they feel they're ready to come back and setting up 
those kind of steps together so the client knows uh, how you're still there to support them if they need it, when and how they can contact you if they're ready, if and when they are ready to come back. So thoughts or comments around therapy and how we refer our clients to therapy or your own experiences, would love to hear. Tanya, could I ask you, yeah. and, and maybe the group as a whole, uh, what impact do you think recent traumas arising from COVID and in particular isolation, working from home, issues that may not be deep trauma, but are nonetheless uh, current traumas for them. How do we navigate that? And in particular in an environment when certainly in the UK, the counseling side of things is totally swamped and yeah. totally stretched. So I would just be curious to know, you know, in today's world, yeah. where do we sit? Yeah, and and I sit probably in that world of if 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 we're truly and let me even back up because I'm always cautious about the word trauma, and we can have traumatic things happen to us, and we can actually have trauma, and I think those are two different ways of looking at it um, because traumatic things that may happen, you can have organizational trauma right within uh, people who are experiencing organizational trauma right now. To your point of, of return to um, office, right? Uh, so you can have traumatic things happen and they may not result in that deep level of trauma that would require more clinical treatment. Um, and if someone is experiencing that, and I know, again, because people have been trapped in their homes quite literally until relatively recently, uh, that could bring up interpersonal challenges, potentially abuse, other things that were exacerbated by the lockdown and exacerbated by the pandemic. And those are things, again, I don't think we wanna start stretching into areas that are outside of our scope and our core competencies and our, and our ethics. Um, but we, to your point, Annalise, want to be probably even more hypervigilant when we're noticing things that, okay, this is probably outside of my realm of where I'm gonna be most effective for this client because yes, what's happened in the last 18 months was traumatic for all of us, but how someone's experienced that could be very different. And coaching may be helpful, but it could be a sign, hey, we need to find other resources. And I think for us as coaches, this is a good time if you haven't already to build up your referral network to know who some of those folks are that you can refer people to for therapy and for um, you know, addiction counseling, all sorts of things that may have gotten exacerbated again by the experiences of the last few months. So I hope that helped a little bit, Annalise. Jacqueline. Yes, hi. Or is it Jacqueline? Is it Jacqueline or Jacqueline? Can I call uh, you Jacqueline? Jacqueline? It sounds fancy. No. <laughs> I'm fine. Jacqueline is fine, but I know in, uh, for, you know, if you say it with the French, it's Jacqueline. <laughs> but you can say Jacqueline. I don't ask anyone to call me Jacqueline, so <laughs> Jacqueline is fine. The only thing is I don't like anyone calling me Jackie, so I'm glad that you didn't do that. I didn't do that. I'm always going to try to go fancy because, you know, I'm from East Tennessee, so. <laughs> <laughs> I, was born, I was born in Tennessee. Oh, nice. Very cool. Very cool. Chattanooga. Oh, not far. As, uh, well, I wasn't even born, but I was raised in Knoxville. So not far from me, about an hour away. Okay. So for me, this, this uh, you know, talking about, the, the, you know, therapy and coaching um, and the difference and when to refer, that's actually really easy for me because I don't know if you can see from my credentials, I am... I'm an LCSW. Yeah. So um, I'm a licensed therapist. Mm -hmm. And so this, this has always been easy for me. I, I know what clinical symptoms look like, and I can tell very easily if someone needs therapy instead of coaching. And I've had many people come to me for, you know, because sometimes people don't really even know what coaching is. And I've had people come to me, and I, the, one, one of the first things that I do is I basically explain it to them. And, uh, and then even if they're still kind of unsure, as I, as we go through the session and they talk about like why they're there, I can really get a sense of, of it because like I said, I'm clinically trained. And so this has always been easy. And, and the thing is, I, even though I am a therapist and I'm a coach, I have two different businesses. I have a separate therapy practice and, that, and then I keep that separate from my coaching practice. So people who come to me for coaching, I make it very clear right away that I am here in the capacity of a coach. And if, you know, for whatever reason, you know, you would need to be referred to therapy, 
uh, I would provide a referral for you or give you uh, uh, options. I don't, I don't ever mix that. If, if I'm someone's coach, I'm their coach. I'm not going to give a therapist, even though I, I, have, I have the capability to do so. Um, that's a clear boundary that I, I make in, you know, with my clients um, yeah. saying, you know, so, so the thing is, you know, I, and I oftentimes encourage people because I am, uh, they know that I have a background as a therapist. I also encourage people like, Hey, you know, don't worry so much about whether you're crossing into therapy territory or not with me. I said, if you do, don't worry, I will say something, I will tell you. And I will then suggest to them, Hey, you know, thank you for sharing that. But um, I think that's a conversation you need to have with your therapist or with a therapist if they don't have one. Most of my clients actually do have a therapist as when they come to coaching to see me. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for sharing that. And everybody take note, if you don't know Dr. Jacqueline, uh, <laughs> that she might be someone to uh, at least connect to get resources if you have a client who needs uh, some of that helps you may be a, a, someone who can expand your network if you don't mind putting yourself out there for that <laughs> um, oh, yeah, no problem yeah yeah, uh, yeah. And it, it, because because it's so important that we keep that separate and keep that separate whether it's therapy whether it's consulting whatever it may be we are coaches and we don't want to stray outside those lines to a point where we actually could do harm right so that's going to be the biggest piece there uh wonderful other comments or questions? I have a personal experience to share. I'm kind of on the side of the coach who needs a therapist. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, so I'm sharing this with you, with the group here, just to show that what I came up with. So I've, I'm in a big life transition, Never mind what's happening in the world. And it's bringing up really old stuff. Like it's you know, having me feel really vulnerable. And I have hired two to three coaches in the last couple of years to help me get my business back up and running. And I end up at the starting gate, but I'm not getting past it. Mm. Now, I don't know how, I'm very high functioning, so I could look like no problem going on. Um, and I'm even working with a therapist I just get rid of because she's, I'm like, she's like, you just do it. And I'm like, if I could just do it, I wouldn't be here. So, 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 the, so I noticed my own stuck, like, there's this, there's something. So I personally thought there sought therapy because I realized it, I can hire coach after coach after coach, but whatever this is, that's right there needs to be dealt with and not in the realm of coaching. So again, the other probably challenge for coaches is I've coach hopped <laughs> a bit. So would they know that? I don't know, but I probably said something. I mean, I, yeah, I have, I have said I've been stuck for a while. So perhaps that might've been a clue perhaps. So. Yeah. Yeah. To, and, and, and to kind of recognize if they're just not able to get there, right. We talked about it. There's just something that they're stuck and especially if there's an awareness that there's something that was created in the past or an event or an experience or something from the past they're carrying forward. Um, we do want to be aware of that. And so many, not so many, but coaches may come in and, and I, in the, it, it, even when I hear with our coaching students and I, I hear the, so what could you do to move forward? It's like, if they knew that they would already be doing it, right? And there is a time for those action related um, questions in line of, 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 of exploration, but it's usually, if it feels that obvious, the client's already thought of it. It's just, there's something else happening. And we want to be aware of that to recognize, okay, this may be something deeper than my particular skills are going to um, really support that. Question about hypnotherapy fall. Uh, again, that's in a, in a different realm. It's a different modality of, of how we can help and support people. Not we, uh, but people get support. Um, so that would be outside, again, the realm of how we show up. And, and hypnotherapy can be a very um, powerful slash dangerous <laughs> thing to engage in, right? So you want to make sure that if there are people who are looking for that, that if you are referring people out to those types of places that you've done a lot of homework to make sure those people are reputable and, and certified to do that kind of work. So thanks. That's a great question. Yeah, Naid. So um, just to add a wrench into the discussion, yeah, please um, do. I have, you know, in my whole life, I've had therapists and I've had coaches and I have had some stuck times 
where therapy has not gotten me unstuck, but coaching has gotten me unstuck. So not, not to throw it an opinion, but just to throw it in the mix. No. And that's, um, I, I tell you one of my favorite uh, discussions with my client, what was it with a client who said, um, I wish I could talk to my therapist the way I talk to you, <laughs> right? Because there was something in, in that engagement where the client didn't feel they were able to move past it. Sometimes they have the awareness and they're ready to move forward. And maybe the therapist is still, you know, we need to dive and dig a little bit more, but maybe the client's able to still dive and dig, but also take some action forward Um, and recognizing that, you know, again, I always say, get as much help as you need, as you can, as you want, um, because you never know what that thing is going to be for you. Um, So thank you for adding that in. That's that's wonderful to have that. And and can I add something as well? Yeah. So with my coaching clients, uh, like I I was saying, uh, oftentimes a lot of them already have therapists. And I always tell them that's great that you're working uh, with a therapist as well. You know, and I don't ask them the details of any of that. Um, But, you know, I do explain that sometimes the stuff we're working on can have some overlap. And so when they when they find that there's a little bit of overlap and they discover something in coaching that they're like, oh, you know, what? I really want to bring this up to my therapist. And I'm like, yeah, that would be great to do. And so I often encourage them to have these conversations with their therapist. And then they sometimes will, you know, in the context of coaching, they'll, as it relates to what we're talking about in coaching, they'll bring it, bring it up. So like a a common topic, oftentimes I work with on leadership development, I actually help people work on um, practicing um, Mm self-compassion as a leadership skill. Mm-hmm. And that sometimes comes up for people um, with their therapists because they'll see a connection to their personal lives or to something from childhood um, as to why they don't practice the self-compassion or why they beat themselves up so much. And we don't get into those things in coaching, but we apply, we apply that practice to you know, their leadership and how they show up as leaders. But then they go back and they have this conversation with their therapist and how it affects them in other areas and other ways and so it can be very complementary um so yeah I just wanted to share that yeah get get all the help you need I have a friend who's a psych a psychiatric nurse and she's like whatever they've got that's helping you get it <laughs> so don't don't feel like there has to be a limitation that we can mm-hmm. have complementary uh, services just to I think everyone's point here um, being clear on where those boundaries are for us as coaches and um, as coaches for our own clients being clear on where we think okay I think now I'm just taking this person's money and I am no longer being of service to them so it would be in their best interest to refer them out to someone else um, when they're really just stuck and we can't help them move forward okay I'd I'd like to share something Um, I'm also a licensed psychotherapist but I'm really have mostly hung up that shingle and moved into the coaching realm and one of the reasons why I think that works for me is I feel like most of the time I did therapy I had more of a coaching style than a therapy style and one example which I actually just thought of right now, this person never would have come to see me if I had been a coach, but I had a client kind of early on in my career who was severely OCD. Mm-hmm. And, um, and then I, you know, I worked with him for quite a long time and, and actually, and I went to all the training to learn the right protocols and, you know, he wouldn't do any of that stuff. But he improved dramatically over the time we worked together. And it was, I had only to do with our relationship, Mm -hmm. which was really, you know, that's a huge therapeutic skill, but it's also a huge coaching skill. And so it's kind of, it's just kind of interesting when I think about that now in this context, how, and really how blurred the lines are for me, but, but that was the one reason that he improved. It was just relationship and someone, you know, getting him. And um, I just think that happens a lot. Yeah, no, and and again, um, especially since you always felt that you had that coaching mindset and how you you actually perform as a as a therapist, um, that maybe allowed you to create space for them while they were still addressing what can be de- very debilitating. We all know CD can have at severe forms can be extremely debilitating, um, and um, you know as that's still being addressed, 
what steps can we start to make in other parts of your life where you feel like I'm ready to keep, to keep moving. And not all therapists are really in that business, right? They're not all really like, they are, it's not the, that, that next step. And that's where a lot of people do end up coming to us as coaches are like, I don't, like, I know I can do something now. And I want to try to understand that, that in a way that allows me to move forward. So I love that. Wonderful. Thank you all for sharing. This is so good. And it is relationship. And that's so much, I think, part of what we as coaches have in that partnership is that we create that trust. And we and, and I think because we aren't necessarily, even if our clients may see us that way, we aren't putting ourselves up here as the expert in their lives. They're the expert in their lives. And we believe in their ability to figure out those answers for themselves. Um, and that's what makes us so different, I think, in many ways from that. So wonderful. Thank you all for sharing. This is good stuff, but I have to keep going because I know I'm going to get some other stuff I want to get to you before, before we uh, wrap up today. Um, but I could do this all day. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if you want me doing it all day, but I could. Um, but let's talk about what's coming up, what's coming up in the coaching industry. And we know the profession is continuing to expand and we have just some data here that I'll share with you. Um, we, in, we anticipate this trend is going to continue. And I think we've all seen, especially in the last 18 months, if anything, for many of us, I know for me, I got busier last year. <laughs> there was that concern, was everything going to shut down? But so many organizations, I'm an executive coach and leadership development consultant, so many organizations were like, we need to support our teams, we need to support our leaders and support our, our groups to, to keep them engaged and to keep them inspired and motivated. Um, so this is, if anything, just continuing to grow. And the fastest growth rates you can see here in the in our slide occurred in the emerging regions, notably in Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, and that's where we see a number of professional coach practitioners has tripled since 2015, in, in between 2015 and 2019, 185% right, in 2019 in, in, in some of these areas, um, specifically Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, the growth was also robust in Asia, we see that 42% there, and Eastern Europe, 41%. Uh, we do see that growth was slower in more established regions of Western Europe and Oceania. Um, North America still posting some relatively strong growth rates, but obviously those rates are not going to be quite as skyrocketing because there is a, a stronger uh, or a longer uh, background and understanding of coaching. So you know what? If anything, there's probably even more demand coming uh, given what's happened over the last few years and um, the opportunities that people recognize and in, in what coaching can do and help them and how it can help them grow. Um, just take a look at the main area of coaching uh, by region. Um, so we see business versus non-business coaching. And when coaching first emerged, it was more based in life and vision and, and enhancement coaching and that one-on-one -on -one type of partnership. And then other specialties began to emerge as well as multiple stakeholders. So we've got organizations, we have the client and the coach, we have other uh, external stakeholders who are connected and recognizing now business coaching. So leadership, executive, corporate, uh, small business, professional coaching is is actually the largest specialty with about 65% of coach practitioners identifying that as their main area um, of coaching. And that continues to grow. It's already, it's been up 3% since that 2015 survey from our, our ICF Global Coaching Study. Uh, life vision enhancement is the next largest, no real change there. So there's always that that need and connection um, for what is considered life coaching. I will usually say all coaching is some form of life coaching because everything is connected to how we do anything. So, um, and then just when we think about the COVID-19 impact um, and although in the COVID-19 and the coaching industry report that we did, it was done in mid 2020, that it was noted that regardless of the main specialty, most coach practitioners were in broad agreement that life vision and enhancement coaching will become even more prevalent coming out of that pandemic. So Annalise, to your points earlier, people are, you know, when you spend a lot of time potentially with the people who push those buttons for you the most, or you're connected to some of the sources where you are having the most challenge, uh, it makes sense that those are areas that people are starting to connect to and want even more coaching around. So um, again, opportunities for people to continue to grow and recognize how much coaching can help them move forward. Um, coaching for social change, right? And uh, Ira's there coaching for the students at UNLV. And I know many of us are, are doing similar things to support um, 
people in our communities and people around the world. And coaching for social change is growing. It's a growing trend. I'm sure no surprise to anyone. Um, its power and popularity became exponentially evident in 2020 with COVID-19, with some of the things that were going on in the world around social justice. Um, coaches are offering their services pro bono or to frontline support essential workers. And it's not only coaches who are offering those services, but nonprofit organizations are seeking coaches for their workers. I don't know if any of you are doing nonprofit coaching or working with um, NGOs, whatever that may be. Um, our International Prison Award honorees have included educational institutions and, and government inter and entities as well. So just recognizing the key role that coaching is playing in social change. Um, we had the family organization, the ICF Foundation, that really focuses on connecting and equipping coaches and organizations to accelerate and amplify the impact on social progress through coaching. Um, would love to hear, I know we're getting a little tight on time, but would love to hear if there's anyone who has anything they want to share around that social change aspect. Manuel. Yeah, uh, so um, um, uh, yeah, because I'm just starting, uh, I have my graduation, I'm still executive in Oracle, you know, and uh, I'm starting providing pro bono cases. And I've been managing the, the African continent for a while. And the first who raised the hands to get some coaches was the was the, the African leader I know in, in South Africa and Africa. So first I see that the trends of Africa leaders that requires coaching is important. And after what I, I strongly um, believe, because I've been working in South Africa and I've been welcome in every single country, uh, even if I'm, you notice my French accent, when you are French, former colony, you have to be very careful. And uh, I've never been um, rejected and so on. And I'm shocked about the diversity and inclusion, at least in Europe, which is a makeup that the company are doing. But in fact, we are in a, in a trend when skills and uh, talent is a big problem. And we don't see any changes in equity, diversity. I don't know if this is something you will go after, but I believe in the future of coaching, you also have our impact in uh, deciding where I have to go the future of coaching. So first pro bono, I do that because this is part of my graduation. And I've seen a, a lot of uh, leaders in Africa and uh, I believe there is at least an, on our side of the, con of the, the continent a real problem with diversity and inclusion. Yeah, no, thank you for sharing that. And that is something that Global is very aware of and is, is, is working on as well. We have our Diversity, Equity, Inclusion Task Force, and uh, we are, um, I think you probably, many of you saw posted, the uh, Chief Diversity Officer that the ICF is looking to bring in, uh, because we recognize that there are, if you look around, if you pull everybody together globally, that there, we don't have a diversity in our coaches or also diverse, a lot of diversity in, in who our clients are, because we want to make sure we're expanding uh, knowledge of coaching and, and access to coaching to people who uh, maybe traditionally would not have considered it or just haven't been informed about it. So it is something the ICF is, is very much aware of and, and taking efforts yeah. to try to address. So um, thank you. But thank you for that awareness. And again, um, I could do a whole nother session on that, on, <laughs> on, <laughs> on coaching around diversity, equity, and inclusion, because it also takes some additional work for us as coaches to understand how we show up and engage our own sense of identity, our own cultural influences, and how that impacts the way we engage with our clients. Again, getting back to my power differential uh, issue, but again, there's so many, there's so much richness there that we as coaches are so primed to actually take on because this is the work we do. It's just now having that new lens to put on top of it. So thank you, Manuel. That's great. Thank, thank you. you for sharing. Um, speaking of that, kind of going along and to, to, to some degree when we're looking at sort of globally how we're looking at coaching, how we're engaging with it, uh, here's a fun one. I'm going to see everybody's faces when I put this one up. Should coaching be regulated, <laughs> right? And this is one that's uh, been a challenge, things that we've been talking about for years. We've seen even um, in the United States, several states try to jump in and decide we're therapists and put those same uh, kind of parameters and requirements on, on what we do. And luckily between ICF chapters like yourselves and, and ICF Global working together have been able to address that. But know that it is something that, is coming at some point, someday. Uh, and actually an increasing majority of coach practitioners believe that coaching should become regulated. And I think as, as ICF coaches who've been through programs and gone through the training and understand that coaching is not something you can just pick up overnight or on a three hour online course, um, it's important I think for us to know that 
there aren't people out there doing harm in, in the name of the coaching industry. Um, so we've seen this increase in 2015, 52% of coach practitioners considered coaching uh, or felt it should be regulated. And by 2019, it's up to 57%. And again, it's a lot of that is driven by the increase in, in, in North America of people who agree with that position uh, jumping up a lot, but we're seeing it happen um, in many parts of the world as people start to understand how important it is that um, we not have people out there again. It's not the wild, wild west uh, of the of the 1800s in the United States where anything goes. That there is a talent and a skill and ethics and competencies tied to coaching that we just don't want people out there saying they're coaches and doing real harm to people. So knowing that that's something that's continuing to grow and there's a lot of interest around that. Um, obstacles for the profession, um, as we said, untrained individuals who call themselves coaches, and, and that creates and adds to that marketplace confusion about what coaching is, and that's what uh, coach practitioners have identified as the biggest obstacle for the next, over the next 12 months. One of the biggest obstacles over the next 12 months is just helping educate people as to what it means to truly have an ICF a trained coach who's been through a, an actual program and helping the marketplace understand what it is that we do. Uh, additional obstacles, clearly, as we might expect, the possibility of a global recession. We know what's happened uh, in the last two years is, is put a lot of strain globally uh, on, on uh, businesses, organizations, individuals, and uh, understanding what the long-term impact of the pandemic is going to be is another concern as well. So just know that those are things that we're all looking at and we're all uh, noticing and, and trying to understand what that impact is. Um, the ICF commissioned uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers to conduct that the, our survey that we did in 2020. And we had a total of uh, what, over 10,000, I think it was 10,028 uh, survey responses from 140 countries. And these were the things that were actually coming up for all of us from a global perspective. Um, so we also had another survey that was commissioned and those results will come out as well. But knowing and, and starting to think about how you're seeing the impact of these things that are occurring um, is really gonna be helpful for all of us to start to look and see what's, what's happening with our, with our clients, what's happening uh, with organizations that we may be partnering with and how that's impacting the way we engage as coaches. I know we're getting close on time here, so I'll go through our, these last couple of slides uh, and then ask any questions that we have. But thinking about technology, uh, even prior to COVID-19, uh, coaches have been adopting different styles of technology in order to um, engage as coaches. I know I was always pretty much virtual, even before the pandemic. I know some coaches were always in person, but current and emerging technologies are what is going to help us perform better in our roles as coaches, um, making sure that we can still build those connections, <laughs> excuse me, um, even if we aren't physically in the same room together. Um, what we would we have done during this pandemic <laughs> if we hadn't had technology, if we hadn't had what is sometimes dreaded, but Zoom and Teams and uh, all the other uh, technology that allowed us to really support our clients regardless of, of where we were. And since the pandemic, coaches have adjusted our, mes our methods um, and how we coach clients, how we connect with them. Um, there has been an 80% decrease in coaching in person, no surprise. Um, and mainly coach practitioners have increased their use of audio video platforms. And I know for some of us, we were doing that even before, but now it's becoming more commonplace. And things that we want to think about and we'll have to invest in more as coaches, given the change in the world. And, and while everyone keeps waiting for us to go back to normal, there probably isn't a normal, a, a, the old normal. Now it's going to look something different. Uh, and so anticipating that the pandemic will have this enduring effect on us, a majority of coaches based on our COVID-19 um, and coaching industry uh, studies here, the majority of coaches, about 63%, um, disagreed or agreed with the, or dis, or strongly disagreed with the, pan, with the statement that after the pandemic, coaching will return to pre-pandemic methods. So we have kind of crossed over now and there is some reality that there's always going to be this technology piece of it and a large majority of coach practitioners also agreed that coaches will have to invest more in technology in the future and you can see this regional uh, breakdown here so 
know that things are changing and they may not change back. Also looking, and, and for the better, I don't think it's actually a detriment. It's just recognizing it's going to look different in the future. Um, also the focus on the democratization of coaching, and this will be our last slide here as we start to wrap up in case Nahid and <laughs> we're getting nervous. I am almost done. Um, but just, just to recognize that with the democratization of coaching, there can be some challenges. But overall, these are great opportunities. The ICF vision is to make coaching an integral part of every part of a thriving society. And that means we want it accessible to all. We see large organizations and coaching brokers getting access, getting people in, in, in those organizations access to coaching. Um, opportunity for us as individual coaches to um, consider different approaches to pricing based on, based on the type of business. Is it a for-profit? Is it an NGO? Um, the availability and affordability of coaching ties into ICF's vision. So also looking at coach training and how do we get access to coach training to our diversity, equity, and inclusion um, questions around how do we get more people, uh, more variety and more diversity of people to become coaches. Also looking at how coaching is offered in organizations because we know in the in that world, coaching is not what we would consider coaching. They tend to use coaching more as uh, a feedback form and we want to make sure we start to educate organizations on what coaching actually looks like within their organizations. Uh, obviously looking at technology, artificial intelligence, and, and how some of those systems are being incorporated into coaching programs. And just looking at the life cycle of the profession as we you know, come in and we may start off as individual coaches and moving into group coaching or even you know, starting to veer off into other areas of you know, OD work and things that, that may be connected but still different from coaching. But all of it with the goal of how do we get more people uh, to have access to these kinds of skills that will help them not need coaches. I always say that's my job is to work myself out of a job uh, because I hope that my clients will have the skills that allow them to make decisions and choices that uh, don't require them to be on the, a phone call with me for 50 minutes every couple of weeks. Um, so that's kind of the big picture. And it was towards the end there, we, we didn't get to inter interact as much because I just, I will always veer towards uh, talking more than, than I would hope to. But here are some resources. I can, uh, I'll, I'll add these into chat so you'll see them, but these are some of the studies I referenced and they uh, refer in a, cli a client to therapy white paper as well. So I'll drop those out there. Um, but that is the end of my show here today. And I see a, I see one hand up before I turn it back over to your wonderful uh, ICF Orange County uh, chapter leaders. Dwayne, what's up for you? Um, so, my, my question has to do with, so I'm currently looking um, at different, you know, coaching programs, um, and I am specifically looking at programs that are accredited through ICF, yeah. but I'm just wondering if there's, if there are any future plans to hold these type of um, classes on how to pick a coaching program, um, because one of the things I, you know, one of the areas I'm kind of interested in coaching is within the African American community. But you know, one of the questions I have is like, how do you coach to a community that um, you know may not have the the financial resources, right, um, mm -hmm. for coaching? And you know, and how do I do that and make a living at it, um, and you know, pay for tuition um, for a coaching program? So I could use some help in deciding on how to pick a coaching program. Yeah, yeah. And I don't know if there's anything that you all are planning to do as, as ICF uh, Orange County, if you have programs or anything thing like that um, uh, planned. I think, you know, as ICF, we are agnostic in some ways. Like we don't want to, oh, you should take this one over that one. Um, but it is important to your point, Dwayne, of um, helping you get clarity on what it is you wanna focus on and then being able to look at the ICF accredited programs that may align best with what is authentic for you and how you want to engage as a coach. Um, so I would, I'll recommend, and, and uh, not Nahid and, and Nor, please feel free to jump in from an ICF uh, Orange County uh, perspective, but using your networks, using the people that you see here, people engaged to talk to people who are doing the kind of coaching that you want to do or who would have access to the resources that might help you make those decisions. Um, but, but definitely you've got 
access to a lot of ICF credentialed coaches here who can help help support you as they, you know, sharing their experiences with different coach training programs that might help you as you're trying to as you're trying to decide. But thank you for choosing an ICF accredited program because that's what we want. We want people who are actually doing it the right way in alignment with the core competencies and the ethics of, of what's going to help our clients, even outside of the ICF, what's best for our clients. So thanks, Dwayne. Thank you, Tanya. And I'll just jump in, Dwayne, and say that in the past, we have had events where we've had coaching schools come and, um, you know, so that you can compare and contrast. But up at those events, we've often had maybe three or four of the top coaching schools, and they are all, you know, pretty much a few thousand at least, you know, to get into, to go, to go through the training. However, um, I do love what Tanya said about utilizing your network. And I do know that in my own networking, coaches have been the most generous people I've known in terms of me reaching out and just saying, what coaching school did you go to and how did you like it? And what did it cost? And have you ever heard of a coaching school that's really focused on, you know, coaching to underserved communities that may not cost as much, but still ICF accredited. I mean, those are really nice specific questions you could ask. And I've asked coaches questions on LinkedIn and on Facebook. And then we have the LA chapter and the Orange County chapter. So there's um, lots of people. And I would say maybe, but just by doing that, maybe you'll get some insights and I wish you the best. Yeah. yeah. And Greta, it looks like Greta dropped in the chat that you are planning to do some meetings on credentialing and talking about sort of. Ooh, Greta, do you want to say something about that real quick? Yeah, sure. So hi, everybody. I'm this year's president of ICF Orange County. And um, <laughs> thank you, guys. And next year, as past president, I'm going to be launching, hopefully in partnership with ICF Global, a series of meetings on credentialing, part of which we'll talk about certification, obviously, because it's the first step in getting your credential. And as part of those meetings, we'll probably be talking about programs Dwayne. But what I can tell you is from my own research, when I was certified as my first step in credentialing years ago, it's a highly personal type of thing. There, there are lots of programs. Yes, if you're planning on um, entering the coaching industry, and even from a competitive point of view, if you want to become an ICF credentialed coach, it, the only way to do that to become a credentialed coach, it's not the only way, but it's um an efficient way is to go with a program that is recognized by ICF. And there are a lot out there. It's expensive, but you have to sort of shop around because it's so personal is, is what I found. And I put my um, email there in, in the chat to you, Duane, and I'll put it to somebody, to everyone. If you want to, if you want to connect with me, I'm happy to talk about it. Wonderful. Thanks, Greta. And thanks to all of you. Thus ends my part of the show, so I will turn it over to all of you. Feel free to reach out, uh, find me on LinkedIn, and uh, it's been great to meet all of you virtually and, and hope to stay in touch. So we'll see you around the universe, my friends. Thank you so much, Tanya. That has just Thank been you. a wonderful presentation, um, really great uh, information, and I love that we also had the links. If any of you are looking for links later, feel free to reach out. Um, keep in mind that we did not offer CCEUs for this session, but again, there's tons of resources available on Global that we'd happy to be happy to refer you to. And um, we also have some sessions coming up next. Uh, let's see, do we have something this Thursday? I need some help here. Do we have a wine, cheese, and chat this Thursday? I'll come yeah, to that. Can, this <laughs> can I come to that one? That one. Yeah, yeah, yeah you're welcome to. Nahid, there's I, a wine, yeah. cheese, and chat. Yeah, with, with our outreach director, Camber Hill. Yeah. Yes, we have a wine, it, cheese, and chat this Thursday. And then next week on the, on the third, the LA chapter is hosting Peter Bergman. And I believe we also have uh, Brené Brown, uh, uh, one of the Brené Brown's certified facilitators speaking next month. And we also have something else that's awesome. Um, at least two or three things plus holiday parties. And there's always so much, I can't remember it all, but tons of stuff coming up. Really appreciate all of your engagement this today. And um, thank you very much, Nanor. Do you have any last words or anything I missed? No. 
This was great. Thank you. Yeah, we'll be sending out a survey shortly as well. All right. Thanks, everyone, for being here. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Thank you. The international community. Yes. <laughs> Welcome. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye, Manuel. Thank you.